The following audiobook contains some mild language. Parental guidance suggested. Some material may not be suitable for children. Sammy Jazz Productions presents Mission on Frog Planet by Sammy Jazz. Chapter 1 In a galaxy far, far away, there's a planet called Pelon 4. It's nice, as far as planets go. Lots of green grassland and forests and such. Deserts, too, and mountains. But this story is about a frog in a swamp. Mind you, he's a civilized frog. If you can call trailer living civilized. He cooks his own food, and he's good at it, too. Thing is, he lives alone. He's been an adventurer or two in his day, but he's done with that life. He found a little spot on the edge of a swamp, a quiet place where people don't come knocking. Except for today, that is. Today was different. A rugged man with a scar on his temple and a cowboy hat in hand approached the little one frog trailer and knocked at the door. Its resident made no answer, so the man knocked again. And when he was still met with nothing but silence, he took the liberty of opening the door. The afternoon sun cast a shadow into the trailer as the broad-shouldered man took a step in. At the other end of the trailer stood the frog man, Craig, dressed in a loose Hayori robe and jogger bottoms. He was not amused. Oh, crap. What do you want, Terran? Calm down, Froggy. I want to offer you a job. A job, huh? He turned his back and beckoned Terran inside with a lazy wave of his hand. Oh, come on in. You want some tea? Nah, that's okay. It's been a while. How you been? Got my own place now. It's a piece of crap, but it's mine. You hungry? Terran opened his mouth to say something, but closed it again without saying a word. He didn't want to impose. Yeah, okay. Craig turned his back and got to work on the stove. There was rice left in the cupboard, but little else. Terran sat in silence as Craig cooked. You want to tell me why you're here? Craig asked without looking up from his cooking. You got a good place here? Clean. Craig hit the spatula twice on the side of the pan to shake the rice off and turned to Terran with a hand on his hip. You gonna quit stalling or what? Terran got straight to it. I need your help, see? Yeah? Uh -huh. Craig said flatly. Terran sighed. I'm after a bounty. Mm, yeah? Uh -huh. It's gonna be dangerous. Yeah? Uh -huh. You ever paid a visit to the Froggy King? Craig smiled a mischievous smile. Chapter 2 Barlow's been dead for years, said Terran. I know, said Craig, a little irritated at the obvious statement. The bounty's on his replacement. Barlow, a benevolent frog king in his day, had passed away several years back and left a throne to his only son. The young frog prince was not up to the task of ruling a kingdom, and power was quickly taken from him by the head of the royal court, Partio. It was well known that Partio did not treat his subjects well. In his greed, he overtaxed his subjects and used the money to fund his extravagant, self-indulgent lifestyle. Uh, sounds like someone finally saved up enough credits and decided to hire a bounty hunter to remove the king, said Craig bitterly. That's the long and short of it, yeah. You keen? What's the bounty? Three thousand credits. It's low, but I figured you'd understand it's for a good cause. Fifty-fifty? Fifty-fifty. They shook hands. It didn't take long for Craig to pack his things. It was almost as if he'd been waiting for something like this to come along. His cupboards were nearly bare and his clothes were all folded and ready to be tucked into his travel backpack. He still had his gear, too. A pair of communication devices, a cut-resistant vest, and a retractable blade that seemed like nothing more than a walking stick until it was ten inches deep inside some poor fellow. It seemed to Terran that Craig had been lying when he said he was done with bounty hunting. Of course, he brought his pans and stuff, too. No one could have talked him out of that. 
He didn't seem to mind the extra weight, and Terran sure didn't mind his cooking. They set off that same day. Never mind that it was nearly dark. It was nearly dark in lots of places in the galaxy. No point in wasting time. Terran hadn't parked a starship very far away. Greg stashed his bag in storage and took the co-pilot's seat. It's good having you back, said Terran. Uh, let's see if we can get this hunk of junk off the ground. Yeah, okay said Terran, a little annoyed. Just like old times, he thought. Terran powered on the engine, and the ship revved to life. They broke the atmosphere without a problem. In the silence of spaceflight, Terran tried again. So? He gave Craig the side eye. How you been? What are you doing, Terran? I don't know. It's just been a while, so. You have a lady friend or something? Lady friend? Are you kidding me? After Kasha, what's the point? Craig was angry. Sure, but... You know what? We're not doing this right now. Not now, not ever. I didn't agree to this so we could talk about our feelings, okay? Okay. Craig sighed a heavy, short sigh. <sighs> I'll be in the back. He unbuckled and made his way to the back room and shut the door. It was the only place on board besides the toilet where you could get some privacy. Terran hadn't meant to bring up Karsha. He knew it was a sore spot. Karsha was Craig's first and only wife. They had been together for less than a year when she was killed in a night raid on Pelon 4, the planet they had just left behind. This all happened before Terran met Craig. Karsha was cute for a frog lady, thought Terran. He'd only seen her in photos, though. Craig developed a bloodlust after her death, so he took a series of kill bounties with Terran until he had saved enough to buy that trailer. Terran turned on some rock music to relax. He knew the vibrations upset Craig, but he wasn't about to let that old frog tell him how things would be on his own ship. When Craig emerged from the back a few hours later, however, Terran immediately switched it off. The grumpy frog retook his seat in the co-pilot's chair without a word. Terran was too nervous to say anything, so they just sat in silence the rest of the way to Carphibian, the land of the Frog King. Chapter 3 The journey from Pelon 4 to Carphibian took about 16 hours in Terran's ship. The planet was mostly covered in water and marsh, except for the volcanic islands, that is, but no one lived around those death mountains. Craig spotted the telling landmark of a pair of large, dormant volcanic peaks and found Terran a safe spot to land in the marsh. Though air breathers called it the land of the Frog King, it would be more accurate to call it the sea of the Frog King seeing as frog folk here lived underwater. From their landing point, it was just 12 miles south and 100 meters down, and they would reach the royal city. Frog folk, unlike their animal counterparts, kept their gills into adulthood, allowing them to remain fully aquatic. Ocean-dwelling frog folk also had the benefit of skin that allowed them to tolerate salty carphibian seas. The city was not easily accessible to air breathers. There remained very few public buildings that were depressurized and filled with breathable air in order to discourage outsiders. Air breathers that visited the royal city didn't enjoy having to breathe through a mask for too long or how inconvenient eating was in an underwater environment. Thus, the city's residents were almost entirely frog folk. After they had landed safely, Terran showed Craig the wetsuit, goggles, fins, and rebreather he had purchased for this mission so he could descend into the froggy kingdom. That'll do, said Craig. What proof do they need that he's dead? Didn't request any, said Terran. So the bounty's probably from someone on the inside. Someone will hear of the king's death. Or they've got an informant on the inside. Sure. Craig doubted that, but there was no use arguing over something neither of them knew about. They opened the starship hatch and breathed in the musky swamp air. The landscape was filled with sounds of croaking frogs and buzzing flies. Other than that, it was peaceful on the surface, pretty similar to the spot Craig had picked out on Pelon 4. Terran had changed into his wetsuit and had his rebreather and goggles around his neck. Craig handed him a communication device. It was designed to be worn on the wrist. Terran loosened it to its largest setting and squeezed it on. I bought these last time I was here, Craig was saying. They're made for frog folk, but it's good to see it fits you too. Barely. 
They're waterproof, so don't worry about that, but communication is limited to a 50-foot radius. Further than that, and we won't be able to hear each other. Terran examined it. Orcatron was pressed into the band. We haven't come up with a plan. Let's not overcomplicate things. We find a way inside, kill the king, and we'll be off-world before anyone knows it was us. Someone innocent might get blamed for it. Not our problem, said Craig. Terran's ship was not equipped for underwater travel, so they approached the city the old-fashioned way, by swimming. Better not to make a big entrance anyway, argued Craig. Man and Frogman dove down into the water. Craig hadn't gone sea diving in some time, and he was pleased when the webbing between his fingers and toes soaked in the water and became firm once again. It made swimming a heck of a lot easier. Craig was surprised how much he enjoyed swimming in open water again. Even if his robe did slow him down a bit, schools of fish darted about and various crustaceans skittered across the ever-deepening sea floor. It had been years since Craig had visited the motherland but he kept on top of the gossip that filtered through Pelon 4. He knew his target, the king, rarely left the safety of his palace. His subjects hated him, but with the royal guard at his command, there was nothing anyone could do about it. Craig wished he could find whoever had placed the bounty and shake his hand. That had to have taken guts. It was not long before the city came into view. Large domes and spherical rooms were built into the undersea landscape. While there were a few air-filled buildings equipped with special pumps to keep water out and to filter the air, most buildings in the Frog City were filled with seawater and had large, rounded windows. Intercity rails carried passengers throughout the city in little capsules similar to train cars. Terran caught sight of frog children playing with large domestic fish and roof gardens with kelp that stretched over 100 feet high. The royal palace was built in the center of the city in an open area of ocean floor. A stretch of open land wrapped around the palace and separated it from the otherwise densely packed city buildings. The palace was a cluster of domes and spheres, as that was the signature of frog architecture. There were several towers and rows of round windows to let in the ocean-filtered sunlight. Private rails, similar to those in the city, wrapped gracefully around the massive palace, allowing for a quick transport from one area to another. The grand building looked beautiful to Terran, but to Craig, who had seen it all before. It was only a reminder of the luxury their target unworthily enjoyed. He doesn't deserve that place, thought Craig. As they neared the palace, Craig was surprised to see two armed guards posted outside the palace gates. They were armored and held spears. When he had last visited Carphibian, Barlow was still king and would not have allowed weapons like that during peacetime. Guards like that are unusual. Things have changed since I last visited this place, said Craig, slightly on edge. So what if things have changed? His voice came muffled through his rebreather. I don't see anything odd about posting guards outside a palace. I just wonder what the point is when you can just swim over them. <laughs> Terran chuckled a little. Craig scoffed. <laughs> the palace is shielded in a nearly invisible dome. Clearly his partner had not done his research and was relying on Craig's years-old knowledge. The guards are posted at the only entry point. That part is normal. Them being armed with spears is what's odd. This used to be a peaceful place. Now, it looks like they're prepared for an attack. An attack? Yeah, by civilians, I mean. I hear rumors on Pelon for about how fed up people are with the king. We're doing these people a service. Craig paused and thought. We should get more information in town. No way we're going to get past those guards on our own. I think you're overreacting. Let's just talk to them. It's probably just a formality. Craig rolled his eyes and shook his head a little. And just what are you going to say to them? I've talked my way into many a guard at Palace. No, you haven't. Okay, but I'm the type that could. Craig threw up his hands. Ugh, oh, well, I can't stop you. You go be an idiot if you must. Meet me at Manta Ray Tavern tonight. Manta Ray Tavern. Got it? Terran had a way of forgetting names. I'm going to get some much-needed information. Craig promptly swam off, leaving Terran alone to face the guards.
Chapter 4 Terran went right up to the guards. One stopped him with an outstretched hand and said, No one enters without an invite from the king. His lordship and I are meeting for lunch today. You're lying. No one has received an invite for today. Then why'd you... <sighs> Never mind. Terran said dismissively. <sighs> okay, I'll level with you guys. I don't have an invite, but his majesty will want to see me. I have secret information. The king's life may be in danger. The guards exchanged looks. No one enters without an invite from the king. The first guard repeated. Terran grunted with annoyance. Defeated, he swam away. When he was back within the city, a mysterious hooded stranger caught his eye and gestured for him to follow. Terran squinted, considering his options. He was armed, so why not see what this frog had to say? The stranger beckoned him around several corners, and then Terran lost him around a bend. Stopping, he looked around. The hell? Why did you... Froggy fingers pulled him into an alleyway, and a hand was brought to his mouth to silence him. The stranger spoke first. What do you know of the king's would-be assassin? It was a frog lady. Interesting. Her face was wrapped in black cloth, likely to hide her identity. You heard that, huh? It's nothing to worry about. I made it all up. Oh. The stranger sounded disappointed. Unless you want him dead. Terran ventured. Listen, I know everyone in this city. I know you're not from here. I don't know what you're up to, but it's nothing innocent. The stranger eyed him through her mask. What we want is to have the throne restored to its rightful owner, the royal prince. But he's been held prisoner in his chambers at the palace. They won't let him venture into the city. They've stirred up a lie that someone's out to kill the prince, and it's for his own safety. But that's nonsense. Terran sensed the woman was irritated. If you'll help me get into the palace, I can set things right. By killing the king? Terran looked her in the eyes. The frog lady squinted slightly. Who are you? I'm on your side. Then he added, The prince deserves his place on the throne. I can get you in, she said, nodding. But we'll have to wait until dark. All right, said Terran. You can meet me at Coral Beef. Do you know it? Uh, no. It's a restaurant on a hill just east of the royal grounds. Can you find your way there this evening? Yes, ma'am. Good. She pulled her hood closer around her face and left the alley. Chapter 5 As the evening sunlight faded, the round windows throughout the city filled with a yellow glow. Electricity had no place in an underwater city. Rather, frog folk relied on sunstones to light their homes and protect them from dangerous sea creatures. Terran went to Manta Ray Tavern first to meet Craig and told him about the stranger's proposition. They made their way to Coral Beef around sunset. It was a tourist-friendly place with a nicely pressurized air chamber for air breathers to eat in. Terran entered first, passing through a series of hatches that kept the air chamber within from flooding. He saw the frog lady right away. She had taken a window seat with a good view of the palace, and was more than halfway through her meal. Terran entered the restaurant, trying to draw as little attention as possible, but it was difficult to go unnoticed, as a human in a frog city. Frog heads turned curiously to eye the human, but a small nod from Terran brought their attention back to their meals. It was a relief to Terran to breathe open air again. The frog woman greeted him, and gestured to a seat across from her. Terran took it. Craig entered a minute later, and took a seat by himself a little ways behind her. This way he could jump in if things got ugly with the stranger. The restaurant was fairly busy this evening. A constant hum of idle chatter filled the room. As long as they kept their voices low, they would be able to discuss without others overhearing. I thought maybe I misheard you before, Terran said. Coral beef? <laughs> Do they really serve beef here? Oh yes, it's their specialty. We frogs love our meat. Would you like to order something? My treat. Terran ignored his growling stomach. He wasn't sure if he could trust the stranger just yet. That's kind of you to offer, but we should discuss the details first. 
of course. She set down her fork and knife and dabbed her mouth with a napkin. She looked out the window and pointed out at a particular tower of the royal palace. See that window about halfway up the tower? The third one from the bottom? That's the one. The prince is in there. Tap two times slow and three times fast, and he'll let you in. Got it, Terran said, committing the information to memory. How do we get past the shield? I will tell you what I know, but the task is up to you. There are small shield generators on the sea floor all the way around the palace. Find one on the east side near the prince's window. You can temporarily disable it with this. She discreetly passed him two small items under the table. Each one has only one use, though, so only use it when you're ready to go in or come back out. She paused. Another thing. The port to disable the shield is only on the outside. Your associate can wait outside and open the shield for you again when you're ready to leave. My associate? I told you, I know everyone in this city. I can recognize a new face when I see it. Taryn kept a straight face. This lady was good. She continued. The localized shield will only go down for a few moments, so move quickly unless you want to get sliced in half when it comes back on. Taryn nodded. The prince should be able to give you more information about the king's whereabouts when you get inside. When you've done it, you can return here and ask Earl where you can find me. He's the bartender here. Ask for Malka. She folded her hands together. If you're successful, I'd like to reward you. That'd be much appreciated, ma'am. Any questions? Can I take you up on that beef now? The stranger smiled. She called over a waiter and ordered the house specialty. When it was brought to the table, she paid for it and said, I'm grateful to you, but I must be going now. Good luck. The frog lady got up and left the tavern. Taryn stuck around to finish his meal. Craig waited for her to leave and then took her seat. She paid for your meal? Taryn nodded with a mouthful of food. Craig looked at the doorway she had left from. Wait. She also figured out that you were with me. I like her. Craig smirked. What'd she say? She told me how we can get in, but I'm going to need your help. Figured. Chapter 6 It was already after dark, so Craig said they shouldn't waste time and go ahead and try it tonight. Taryn agreed. He didn't enjoy going back out into the water, but it couldn't be helped. When they neared the east side, the frogman knew how to spot the small shield generator built into the seabed. It was a small, box-shaped device that protruded slightly on either side of the shield wall that it projected. Twenty or so such devices encircled the grounds and encased the palace in a nearly impenetrable defense. The generators were powered by small sunstones and encased in metal. Terran took a look at the devices the stranger had given him. They were small, metal drives, only a couple inches long and less than an inch across. Craig briefly wondered how the frog woman had come across tech that could disable royal property. It was good that they had found her. Craig had not been successful during his day around town, but he wasn't about to tell Terran that. Craig found the port to insert the device and looked at Terran. He was aware that this would likely be their only shot at this. The drive goes here. Wait, do you think you're the one that's going in? Well, yeah, it just makes sense. I was the one who found the frog woman. I'm going inside. That doesn't make a difference. You're still a human in a frog palace. I have a better chance moving about unnoticed. You know I can be sneaky when I want to be. What, do you not trust me anymore? No, I just... No, you know what? If you want it that badly, you go. But we only have one shot at this. Craig waved the drive at eye level. One shot is all we need, said Terran. Craig refused to acknowledge Terran's overconfidence. He bent down next to the generator, stuck in the small drive, and the generator made a soft hum sound before flickering off. Terran saw that as his cue, and stepped over the threshold. As they had been warned, only a few moments later the generator came back to life and closed Terran in on the other side. Don't mess it up, said Craig. Terran nodded in response and said something back, but Craig couldn't hear him through the shield. He guessed Terran hadn't heard him either. Terran cautiously swam along the seabed, keeping an eye out for patrolling guards. But there were none to see. He swam up the side of the tower, careful to avoid the windows on his ascent. 
he reached the prince's window and knocked two times slow and three times fast. There was a moment of silence, and then the window was unlatched and a voice whispered, You'd better get in here, quick. The yellow-tinted glass swung outward on a hinge, like the front of an old diver's helmet. Terran slipped to the window and into the water-filled room as quickly as he could. Once inside, Terran saw that the prince's room was spacious, especially for a room in a tower. It had polished stone flooring and stone-etched columns built into the wall. The columns had shapes of massive sea creatures, ornate shells, and frog-style embellishments. A large black and white spotted placotomous fish, presumably a pet, had stuck its bottom feeder mouth to the wall. It seemed to be asleep. Despite the surrounding luxury and the company, Terran knew even a beautiful prison was still a prison. The prince was surprised to see his visitor was a human. Where did you learn that knock? From the frog lady that sent me here. I'm here to remove the king and restore you to the throne. The prince was shocked for a moment, but then responded with, Ah, I see. He paused. Well, I'm afraid that will not be possible tonight. What do you mean? I mean the dear king is the only one standing in the way of my own death. Terran just looked at him confused. The prince went on. I see, I must explain. Shortly after my father died, an off-worlder appeared at the palace one day with an offer. He said he would either take the throne by force or sign an agreement for a portion of the kingdom's profits. Partio negotiated and signed a contract with the off-worlder. In return for 70% of our trade profit, Partio was allowed to hold the throne and I was allowed to live. I suspect he's nothing more than a pawn king to that blasted air breather. This last bit was said with bitterness, and the prince looked at Terran suddenly. Apologies. I do not mean to offend. All while the prince was talking, the spotted Placo had made its way over to Terran. He tried to shoo the slimy creature away, but it continued to curiously inspect him with its catfish whiskers. When the prince wasn't looking, he tried to nudge the fish away, but it persisted. It began sucking on Terran's foot when the prince looked up at him. Terran uncomfortably pushed the Placo off. That's all right, Prince. Uh... Tiernadad, the prince offered graciously. My name is Tiernadad. He bowed his head slightly. Terran awkwardly bowed back. The Placo returned to the wall sadly. Tiernadad looked dejectedly out the window. So you see, my life is safe only as long as Partio lives, and the contract remains valid. Terran cleared his throat. <clears> throat> well, uh... You've given me a lot to think about. I'll have to take some time to assess the situation and, uh, come up with a new plan. He made for the window. Ah, I understand. Well, give my regards to my... He caught himself. The frog woman. Terran tipped an imaginary hat. Will do. He peeked out the window to make sure no one was watching and made his way out. Back at the shield generator, Craig looked angry. What the hell happened? We only had one shot at this! I, I know, I know. But the prince, well... Terran pulled at the collar of his scuba suit. I think... The being underwater is getting to me. Can we talk back at the ship? Craig was impatient. Oh, fine, come on! They made for the surface. Craig swam ahead without turning back to see if Terran was following. Terran barely kept pace. Even with the special gear, Craig was better adapted to the water. It took them less than ten minutes to rise at 150 meters depth of the palace floor. It was past dark. Terran went straight for his ship. He needed to lie down. He climbed up the ladder rungs built into the hull of his ship. But before he could even open the hatch, Craig was hassling him. So, what happened down there? Why was it so necessary to leave? The prince is being protected by Pasho. Terran climbed down the short ladder inside the hatch of his ship. Craig was right behind him. Protected? From what? Some off-worlder. He didn't seem to know much else about it. And I didn't ask. He was fumbling through the cupboards for something, not looking at Craig. You're going to have to explain a bit more than that. Why would an off-worlder have any reason to want the prince dead? What would Parsio have to gain by protecting him? He already has the throne. Why doesn't he just say, screw you in your lion, I've got the power now? 
Partial made a deal with a guy for the throne, and he negotiated for Prince What's-His-Name's life. Maybe Pasho gives a damn about the lad. Maybe he had some respect for the previous king and wanted to protect his heir. I don't know. It doesn't matter anyway, because we can't go back. Prince doesn't deserve to die. Taren found a small pill bottle and urgently opened it. He looked inside, huffed, and threw it across the room in frustration. Empty. I meant to refill it on Palon 4, but... You always rush at me. He wanted to say... Terran's outburst had shut Craig up. He pinched the bridge of his nose and continued. Look, this mission was just an excuse to see you again and get you out of that dung heap you call home. But this is... He shook his head slightly. It's too big a business to get involved with. Ain't worth the risk. What'd you say? Terran held up his palms. Okay, I take it back. You did well with that little trailer. Nice than any place I've ever had. No, 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 screw the trailer. This mission. It's just an excuse to what? Never mind that. Tyrion was avoiding eye contact. He got busy unfolding his bed from the wall. No, you said... Oh, hell, I thought it was weird you taking such a low bounty, but I didn't put it past you. I mean, you an idiot. Slightly offended, Tyrion said, Hey now. But Craig stooped down to pick up the bottle Tyrion had thrown. It was a bottle of pain meds. You hurting or something? Said Craig, his voice betraying his concern. Yeah. <clears throat> My joints feel real stiff. His face was twisted in pain. <sighs> you aren't supposed to come up that fast. Craig said, mostly to himself. Well, you- I know. Craig cut him off. Taren laid down on his bed. I'll be fine. I just need to lie down. He was done talking. I've got something in my bag. Just give me a second. He had a small bag of seed pods that he intended to cook into a dish, but he knew enough of them taken together acted as a natural pain reliever. Craig held the bag up and turned back to Taryn, looking pleased with himself. Taryn shrugged at him. These'll help, trust me. Craig got to work crushing the pods and squeezing out their juice into a bowl. He crushed some berries into it too, so it wouldn't taste so bitter. When he was finished, he handed the bowl to Taryn. Bound to make you drowsy, just so you know. That's okay. I'm already tired. He sat up, quickly drank down the mixture, and handed the bowl back to Craig. He lay back down and fell asleep almost instantly. Craig unrolled his own bedroll. They could figure out what to do in the morning. The next morning, Taryn found Craig sitting outside in the weeds, looking out over the water. He came out and stood next to him. So, will you still kill the king, or what? Craig rose to his feet. No, no, we can't do that. He threw a rock, and it skipped four times before going into the water. I have a better idea. Chapter 7 That evening... A sneaky frogman swam along the ocean floor on the east side of the palace. He ascended the outside of a tower, and when he got to the third window from the bottom, he tapped two times slow and three times fast. The prince within opened the window, surprised to have a visitor two nights in a row. I'm with the human you met last night. We've come up with a plan based on what you told us, Craig explained. If you do what I say, you stay alive and get the throne back. How are you going to accomplish all this? Look, Tierney, Craig started. The prince did not like the nickname, but he made no comment. The way I see it, you don't really have a lot of options right now. I can't give you a reason to trust me. I'm just a frog you just met. But the frog woman who gave us the secret knock decided to trust us. And now it's your turn. You can trust me or not. What do you say? The prince straightened himself. How can I be of service? Craig smiled. King Partio sat in his private chambers alone. He had a stomach full of seared duck. Craig nodded to a guard in the hallway, 
and slipped into the king's room unnoticed. The king was dressed in a sleeping robe. He bent over a dresser drawer, looking for the sash to tie it shut. Craig caught him with his back turned, and had a knife to his throat in a moment. Your subjects have had just about enough of you, King Parcio. Today may be your last day. Are you listening? The king, frozen in terror, simply nodded. You've got a choice. You abdicate the throne to its rightful heir and disappear into obscurity. Or I kill you right here and now. Not much of a choice. Life's like that sometimes. Unfortunate. The boy is under my protection. <laughs> Not anymore. Not too far away, a spaceship had just broken the atmosphere and was in orbit around Carphibian. It had two passengers, a human pilot and a frog prince. Gosh! I've never been in the stars before! This is incredible! That's something special, ain't it? I'd say! Only a week later, word had spread of the upcoming coronation of Prince Tirnadad. The king had mysteriously vanished, but his subjects didn't much care. They were glad to be rid of him. A small group of frog nobles dressed in their finest had gathered in the Grand Throne Room for the coronation. Even a few distinguished members from other cities had heard the news, and had come to show their support on this momentous day. Weapons had been restricted from entering the throne room, just as good King Barlow had once done. A young frog boy in princely attire walked up the center aisle to receive his crown. The nobles bowed as the frog boy walked past them. At the end of the room stood the head of the royal court. Beside him, a servant held the king's crown on a pillow. Royal guardsmen flanked them on either side. The frog boy reached the end of his march and knelt down to receive the crown. Craig watched from his seat among the nobles. He was dressed in fine clothing to match the occasion and had his walking stick in hand. The ceremony concluded shortly and the newly crowned king walked among his guests as they enjoyed refreshments. After nearly everyone had a chance to greet their new monarch, the new king bid goodbye and retreated to his chamber. A guard went with him. Craig scowled at that and followed them from a distance. He brought his wrist to his mouth. You in position? Yep, came the reply. Craig watched the guard follow the frog boy into the king's chambers. He stopped just outside the door to listen. Excuse me, your majesty, but I was wondering if you needed anything. No, thank you. You may go. There was a moment of silence. Uh, I said, you may... The frog boy made a painful guttural sound then, and Craig rushed into the room. The guard had stabbed him in the gut with a small concealed blade. The second he saw Craig, he made for the window. He already had a head start, and Craig would have lost him if he had not cleverly orchestrated this entire day. Terran waited patiently outside the window, and when the guard swung it open to escape, he was shocked to find a human waiting for him just outside. Going somewhere? Terran said smirking, before punching him in the face. The guard stumbled back towards the door, but Craig was in his path. Terran grabbed the guard and pulled his hands behind his back. Looks like today didn't go like you planned. He bound the guard's hands with some rope and escorted him out the room. Craig went to the false king. You did good, kid. Did my vest do the trick? Yep. He pulled back his robes to reveal Craig's pierce-resistant vest underneath. Uh, just a bruise, but I'll be fine. Does this mean Prince Tanadad can come back? Perhaps. Terran locked the would-be assassin in a prison cell below the palace. Craig arrived to interrogate him, but the coward had already spilled his story to Terran. He claimed to work for a crime lord by the name of Krish. You ever heard of him? Asked Terran. Oh, yeah, said Craig. I've heard of him all right. Craig and Terran returned to the upper palace and were greeted by a beautiful frog woman in a crown. She was accompanied by Prince Tirnadad and the two guards Terran had talked to on his first day in the city. Craig and Terran bowed at her approach. She approached Craig and gave him a kiss on the cheek. Terran noticed a slight blush on Craig's cheeks. You're a clever frog, Craig. The queen's voice was instantly recognizable as the stranger they had met at Coral Beef. I apologize for keeping my identity a secret, 
but I couldn't allow Parshio to know I was in the city. We understand, Your Majesty. And now that you've restored me to my former home and my son to the throne, I can offer you 3,000 credits each as a reward for your efforts. The queen waved her hand, and the servant brought a small chest forward. I'm grateful to you both. She took the chest and handed it to Craig. One thing I don't understand, though, continued the queen. How did you know there would be an attempt on the prince's life on his coronation day? Parcio genuinely wanted to protect the prince's life, Craig explained. He told me the offworlder said if the prince ever left his room, he'd know about it, and the prince would be dead the same day. That's why it was so important to make the news public, so the assassin would be sure to show. Craig smiled, pleased with himself. I had a suspicion the traitor was already in the palace, but it was easier to draw him out rather than go sniffing for the rat. The traitor gave us a name, too, added Terran. He was paid off by Krish. Now, normally that would make me nervous, but... Since we've captured his inside man, word of the shift in leadership won't reach him nearly as fast. We'll bring word back to our guild about this and get someone to look into it for you, your majesty. Wouldn't want Prince T here to have any more trouble for a while. You will see us again. Craig gave a bow, and Terran followed suit. It'll be just Craig next time, though. Motion living isn't too kind to us air breathers. The queen smiled sympathetically. May the true king live a long life. The offworlders bowed in goodbye. Craig and Terran made their way back to the ship. Craig waited to reach the surface before opening their reward. He didn't want to seem rude. Back inside the ship, Terran peered over Craig's shoulder as he opened the chest. Inside was the bounty prompts to them. 6,000 credits worth of gold coins. The queen had also included a set of gold cutlery, beautifully etched with frog designs. That's a nice bonus, the queen throwing in the forks and knives, said Terran. Yes, said Craig. And this is for you too. Craig reached into his pocket and tossed him a small bottle. Terran caught it and looked at the label. Pain reliever. He smiled. <laughs> I'm gonna need it. My body's killing me. He returned his cowboy hat to his head and sat down in his pilot's chair. Craig joined him in the co-pilot's seat. You know, he said in a serious tone, when you showed up on my trailer a couple weeks ago, I thought you'd taken a bounty from someone who wants me dead. What? Yeah, I see now how ridiculous that is. <laughs> I'm a little hurt at how little you know me. His words were true, but Terran played it off sarcastically. Yeah, well, you're a good guy, Terran. I'm sorry I misjudged you. I was an idiot. That makes two of us. Craig chuckled a little at that. <laughs> yeah. So where are we headed? I have half a mind to go on one more adventure. Half a mind? Terran teased. Craig just looked at him with faint annoyance, but he couldn't help but smile. We can do better than 6,000 credits in a pile of silverware. Yeah, we can. Terran brought the starship to life and the two friends set out on their next adventure. We hope you have enjoyed the full cast production of Mission on Frog Planet by Sammy Jazz. Featured voice actors include Lucky Raphael as Craig, Brock Mills as Terran and King Partio. Michelle Goff as the Frog Queen. John Kava as Prince Tirnadad. Max Marshall as the Fake Prince. And Jay Silver as the Guards. Narrated by Dave Lee. The text of Mission on Frog Planet is copyright 2022 by Sammy Jazz and this production is copyright 2022 by Sammy Jazz Productions. Print version of the book is available on Etsy. This entire production was recorded in each voice actor's home studio and edited in Roseburg, Oregon.